Good morning and welcome to worship here at Central United Methodist Church in Mount Airy, North Carolina. My name is Danny Miller. I'm the senior pastor here. And we are so blessed that you have woke up this morning and joined us here on the World Wide Web through live streaming on Facebook. It is a busy week here at Central. Not only are we celebrating the third Sunday of Advent, we are also uh, pre preparing to have our annual White Christmas celebration. That's going to look a little bit different this year because of uh, COVID, and we're going to morph that into a drive-through event beginning at 7 o'clock this evening. It'll be from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., and you'll enter uh, the church campus here at the corner of North Main, we're located at 1909 North Main Street here in Mount Airy. So uh, at North Main, at the church uh, sanctuary lawn, you'll turn uh, down Country Club Road and then take the first right on Central Church Lane and ushers will be there to direct you into our parking lot. And once you get there, uh, you'll be able to uh, use our bulletin and some QR codes or a uh, CD depending on how you're set up in your in your automobile and you'll be able to hear the Christmas story as you drive through our parking lot. The only thing is we encourage and ask everyone that comes to bring a non-perishable food item, uh, canned food or uh, otherwise, that's wrapped in white paper or white tissue paper and there'll be an opportunity for you to present that as a gift, uh, a gift to Jesus Christ. But all of those food items that are collected will go to fight hunger here in this community of Mount Airy. So please come. It's from 7.30, excuse me, 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. tonight right here at Central United Methodist Church in Mount Airy, North Carolina. I invite you to please look uh, in your bulletin uh, that's been provided and you'll find information about the remainder of our Advent calendar and celebration of Christmas. Uh, next Sunday will be, uh, excuse me, we have on the 17th a festive Christmas concert uh, featuring uh, our music director Eric Cook on the organ. And then on the 20th, there'll be a special service of lessons and carols at the 11 o'clock service here, live streamed. Uh, the longest night service will also be live streamed at seven o'clock on the 20th, that's that evening. And then our December 24th Christmas Eve service will be live streamed uh, at seven o'clock on Christmas Eve. Christmas morning, we have a special prayer service, morning prayer service that'll be live streamed at 10 a.m. Okay, and that festive Christmas concert on the 17th at seven o'clock, uh, that will be posted uh, on our uh, Facebook page right here for Central United Methodist Church. One other thing I need to let you know about is that um, there's gonna be a COVID, a mass COVID testing site here in the church, at the church, Friday, December the 8th through Tuesday, December the 22nd, and those times are posted um, uh, in our bulletin. So if you need to be tested, uh, this will be the site of a, a mass testing site run by the Surrey County Department of Health and Nutrition from December the 18th through December the 22nd. You can check our website, your bulletin, or the County uh, Health Department website to find out those times. Mr. Danny, can we mention the care kits with the longest night? If okay. they would like one of those, right. contact me. Yes, um, we, we also have some kits that are available uh, for our longest night service, which is uh, next Sunday, December the 27th, excuse me, the 20th at 7 o'clock. And those care kits uh, each include a candle and other items that can either be dropped off to your door before the service or um, uh, mail to you if you live out of town. And if you need those, please uh, contact uh, Reverend Kenneth Thomas. Uh, that's kthomas at wnccumc.net. 
and please do that by December the 18th. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your power and presence throughout this time of Advent. As we use Advent to prepare to celebrate yet again the birth of Jesus Christ, help us to be wise, especially during these times. And Lord, uh, in those times when we feel isolated or all alone, remind us that you are with us. You are Emmanuel. And Lord, uh, direct us uh, with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might always whether it's Advent, Christmas, or any time of the year, worship you in truth and in spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Merciful God, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may celebrate aright the commemoration of the Nativity and may await with joy the coming and glory of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. May Almighty God, who caused light to shine out of darkness, shine in our hearts, cleansing us from all our sins and restoring us to the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, our opening hymn this morning found in the bulletin provided is Lo, How I Rose Air Blooming. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation.
O come, O come, Emmanuel. Today's Old Testament lesson comes from the book of prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Today's Psalter reading is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy carrying their sheaves. Today's epistle lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, church, please affirm our faith as we use the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we're going to sing all three verses printed for Away in a Manger, found in your bulletin. And as we sing, would all the children please gather around the screen for our children's time. Good morning and happy third Sunday of Advent. I hope you had a great week. We keep getting closer and closer to Christmas. And tonight we are having our White Christmas program. And yes, it's a little different. We're doing a little drive-in um, program starting at seven o'clock and going to 8.30. And you can come during any of those time and during that time frame. So come at seven, great. Come at 7.15, wonderful. Come at 8.30 great. So we look forward to seeing you and I will be going live later today um, on our Facebook page to kind of give you some more instructions because, you know, there's a little bit more to this tonight. So we've got some kind of a interactive uh, drive through Christmas program. So, all right. So as we lead into the third week of Advent, we keep talking about these preparations and how we are preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ, preparing for Christmas. We have talked about how we decorate our homes and um, inside and the outside and how we decorate our classrooms and our offices and our cars. And last week we talked about decorating orange traffic cones. Yeah. And may, many other areas of our lives. So in all of these things that we help decorate, that we use to help decorate, Christmas lights seem to be the one main thing in everyone's decorations. When I was younger, I can remember myself and my family going to see Christmas lights. It is a small memory I have of getting in the car with my family and going to this random place in technically the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So as you know, I grew up in Bethlehem, not that Bethlehem, and we are part of the outskirts of another bigger town, well, I guess it's bigger, called <laughs> Taylorsville. Yes, Taylorsville, isn't that so North Carolinian. So, <laughs> and we would travel to this random road to see Christmas lights. The place was called Shook Valley, and technically that was the name of the road as well. And a couple of families, or one big family, would just get together and put up Christmas lights just to share joy with anyone. 
Well, after several years, sadly, they stopped doing their light display. And when I was young, that was the one place that I remember going. Now, there were probably other places that were bigger and grander that we could have traveled to, but my family decided that we would stay close and support a local family. I can remember traveling on that road and then turning onto the road that leads to the lights, and I enjoyed seeing all of the colors and the brightness of the lights. Today, you can go online and you can type in Christmas lights near me, and you can get a list, a decent list, of many places that you can go and enjoy Christmas lights. So have you gone to see Christmas lights already? Maybe you can remember as a child um, going to see Christmas lights with your family. Or maybe you remember taking your kids or even your grandkids to see these beautiful, sparkling, bright Christmas lights and watching the joy that comes over their faces. Christmas light displays have come a long way in recent years. When I was growing up, Christmas lights were bright and cheerful and exciting, and they've grown into something even bigger and more elaborate in the recent years. There are some displays that will change to the tempo of a song. Um, and recently I've seen where they have like talking Christmas trees that would talk to each other. That's pretty neat. They're very innovative and very creative and they, you, all these different ideas that people have come up with. There's something about going to a special location and turning in and having your face light up with the glow of thousands of Christmas lights. The colors or even the warm white glow just reflects in your eyes and you smile with excitement. Are you smiling now? Um, as we visualize this, or if you have memories that are coming to mind of these special times, how do they make you feel? So think about that as we go over this. John the Baptist was sent by God to tell others about light. Wait, was he talking about light displays? No. He was talking about the true light, Jesus. Jesus was sent to earth to bring this light to shine for others to see. Christmas lights are showing up everywhere. And, you know, and it's a great re reminder to us of the true light of Jesus and the true reason that we celebrate and we prepare for Christmas. John chapter 1, verse 5, it talks about Jesus in this way. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the light of the world and shines brighter than any light display that we can ever see, and breaks through any of that darkness that we have. That feeling you might have had when describing the warmth and glow from seeing a special light display is the feeling I hope you have when you hear how Jesus was sent here. For you and for me, Jesus is the brightest light in this world and for this world. And as we prepare for Christmas and we have these visual, visual, oh, I can't speak, visualization. <laughs> so when you visualize, there we go, um, all of these wonderful things of Christmas lights, remember that we are preparing for Christ. We're preparing in our hearts and anywhere else we can see. Let us pray. Dear most gracious and heavenly Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for this wonderful week. Lord, we just ask that you continue to bless us as we prepare for Christmas, as we get things together um, in our hearts and in our minds, and we are able to see that light shine, not only from the light from the Christmas trees or from our homes or from the Christmas displays, but we are able to see the true light, the true light from Jesus, the true light from God. Lord, I ask that you just continue to bless us through this week as we prepare for many things here at the church and that we bring the special, special messages that we have for everyone here at Central and in the community of Mount Airy and outside. Lord, um, we just continue to ask that you continue to bless and keep this community safe and healthy so that we can join together again in your glory and everything we say in your name, amen. Have a great week.
those lights are so pretty, Keisha. Thank you. And I, I put a note in the comments. If y'all want a little bit more joy, did you know that you can also get phone charging cords that have those Christmas lights on them? I've had them on my desk in my office at the college for, I'm not going to tell y'all how long, but they've been bringing me joy a little earlier this year before Advent and Christmas. We have so much to be grateful for. We thank you, Central Family, for all that you have done to just keep our church being the church not only in fellowship with one another, but also supporting our community. And we thank you for those who heeded the call to come out yesterday and pack sand and luminaries. We had so many people. At one point, we didn't know what to do with everybody, but we developed a system. We got it done. And tonight, it's going to be a beautiful beautiful testament to Jesus's light to our community. So we look forward to having you all there tonight. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Rejoicing God, we offer you thanks and praise for this season of anticipation, this season of Advent. As we prepare for the birth of your son, we share our tithes and offerings and our talents and treasures. With the joy and excitement that is common as one anticipates the birth of a new child, Lord, we ask that you would bless these gifts in your holy name. Amen.
The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Eternal God, you sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for the coming of your son. Grant us the wisdom to see your purpose and openness to hear your will, that we too may prepare the way for Christ who is coming in power and glory to establish his kingdom of peace and justice through Jesus Christ, our judge and our redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We ask that you all continue to lift up those on our prayer list this week. Um, we ask that you would lift up Ronnie Kirkman, Belinda Stillwagon and her family, and of course the family of Mabel Shaw. If there are any others that need to be lifted up or added to our list, please let us know by contacting Gail or Pastor Danny or me. Let us pray. Lord of time and hope, we are rushing headlong into the holidays to come. We look at our calendars and our planners and wonder how we will get everything done in the time allotted to us before the big day arrives. We begin to panic at the thought of those things still needing to be finished, contacts that need to be made, preparations that have only just begun. And the darkness of obsessive holiday planning overtakes us and clouds our minds and spirits. But you are a God of time and light. You bring hope to us, God, as you always have, through the voices of the great prophets and now through the one who is to come, Jesus Christ. Lord, remind us again what this season is truly about. Love, hope, peace, and joy. Calm us down. Slow us down. Help us remember that it is in loving relationship that you gave your son to us, and it is in loving relationship that your word is carried into the hearts of the people. Lord, no tinsel, ribbons, tape, cards, can convey the eternal message adequately. You have given us the light to shine in our path and cut through the darkness. Shine in our hearts today. Bless those dear ones we've named and those unspoken before you today with your healing, reconciling, comforting presence and love. Give strength to all who face difficult situations and let your compassionate light shine on them, guiding their decisions and their steps. And Lord, bring us at last to your presence where the light of hope and love continually pour out on us. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn this morning, church, is It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Let us join together.
Let's turn now to the Gospel of John. There in the first chapter, we'll begin uh, with the sixth through the eighth verse, and then we'll move to verses 19 through 28. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not delay it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandal. sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, last week, uh, Kenneth introduced to us John the Baptizer with the description of John and his ministry in the Gospel of Mark. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. His clothes were woven from coarse uh, camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist. He, uh, for food, he ate locusts and wild honey. From that description, John the Baptizer sounds like a really strange fellow, a real bird. But actually, John the Baptizer behaved like many of the prophets described in the Hebrew Bible or what we call the Old Testament. Several prophets wore garments made of coarse animal hair. Since John the Baptizer lived and worked in the wilderness, it's only natural that his meals consisted of whatever food he could find, including bugs and bug byproducts like locusts and wild honey. According to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John the Baptizer's preaching attracted large crowds. John the Baptizer's message, though, is pretty simple but effective. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Pretty simple. It was effective because the Jews, the nation of Israel, was primed and ready for God to send the Messiah in order to kick out the Roman Empire. The people of Israel were desperate for the Messiah to establish the kingdom of Israel and reestablish the throne of King David forever and ever. John the Baptizer's prophetic message about getting ready for the kingdom of heaven spoke not only to their faith in God, but also to their hopes and dreams for a better future. So all of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Now, the activity of John the baptizer, how he behaved like a prophet from Old preaching, uh, from Old Testament, uh, his preaching from uh, the, 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 his, the message about the kingdom of heaven coming near, and all those crowds that went out into the wilderness to hear him and to hear him speak and to be baptized got the attention of the religious authorities in Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and the Pharisees. Plus, there was something else intriguing about John the Baptizer. 
He was the son of a priest himself, a priest named Zechariah. Now with all these facts and with all that was happening, an investigation was launched. A committee of experts was sent out into the wilderness to ask questions. They wanted to know exactly who John thought he was and exactly what he was up to. First things first, who are you, they asked. John came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. And since the committee got that out of the way, the next question they uh, had to ask John was whether he was the prophet Elijah, who some believe would reappear to announce the coming of the Messiah. Well then, who are you, they asked. Are you Elijah? No, John answered. Are you the prophet we are expecting? You see, the priests and the Levites had read in the scriptures, the Old Testament, that Moses declared, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from among you, your fellow Israelites. John gave him the same answer as before. No, I'm not the prophet. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I'm a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. It's interesting that the priest and the Levites stopped right there and didn't ask John any questions about the Lord who is coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? Now, the act of baptizing the Israelites in preparation for the arrival of the Messiah or, or the day of the Lord isn't even mentioned in the Old Testament. However, John's baptism would serve as a powerful, powerful sign to the Israelites. That's because according to John, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, John the Baptist was performing all those baptisms on the east side of the Jordan River, near the place Listen to this, near the place where God stopped the river from flowing long enough for Joshua and their ancestors to cross over. Their ancestors followed the Ark of the Covenant on dry ground to complete their exodus from Egypt into the Promised Land. So with John's baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the breaking of the covenant, the Israelites would turn to God and be ready to follow the Messiah into the kingdom of heaven. But John didn't explain it to him that way. Instead, he answered, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. In other words, John the baptizer's purpose was to point to someone greater than himself. John was there, like he said, to clear the way for the Lord's coming. John was out in the wilderness pointing to the Lord, the Messiah, the Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yes, John the baptizer was strange. He was a real bird, carrying on out there in the wilderness in his camel hair suit, eating locusts and wild honey. But John the baptizer would probably describe himself not as a bird, but a bird dog. I'm not a bird hunter by any stretch of the imagination. I watch a few birds, but I don't hunt them. But I know that bird hunters love their bird dogs. When you're around old bird hunters, they will tell you some great stories about hunting and about their bird dogs. Pointers, setters, spaniels, retrievers, dog breeders and trainers uh, around the country have become known for bird dogs. Even back in the early 1900s, hunters would travel from all over to purchase good bird dogs for great, great sums of money. A good bird dog will hunt through the field and the brush, and when it finds its game, it will curl up one of its front legs and stick out its tail, stand perfectly still, and point its nose straight in the direction of the bird. And a good bird dog will hold that point until the hunter tells it to flush out the bird. And that gives the hunter enough time to set up to take a good shot. My Uncle Ted was an avid outdoorsman and bird hunter. 
he had a bird dog, an Irish setter named Red. Red was a beautiful dog with long, flowing red hair. She was one of the smartest dogs I've ever been around. Red followed every command that Uncle Ted gave her. He was really proud of that dog, Red. Well, one day at my grandparents' house, Uncle Ted and Aunt Lib were getting ready to go see Aunt Lib's family in another part of town. Uncle Ted said he would give me a dollar to watch Red. Uncle Ted said, I'm going to give you a dollar to watch my dog, but if anything happens to her, I'm going to take back the dollar and give you something else. Make sure you take her out to do her business, and when you do, put her on a leash. Red will listen to you, Danny, but, but keep her on that leash whenever you take her outside. Well, that day I watched that dog like a hawk, and I treated her like the queen of Sheba. And I got to keep that dollar. But you know, the strange thing was, Red never went bird hunting with Uncle Ted. She went everywhere else with Uncle Ted. Uncle Ted even had pictures of Red laying on the deck of his fishing boat. Red would go fishing, but that dog would not hunt. I remember Aunt Lib saying that Red either had better things to do than hunt, or that Red was too smart to hunt. You see, Red would have to do all the work. As followers of Jesus, we have to be something like John the Baptizer. To do that, we may have to be a bit of a bird and a bit of a bird dog. We may not have to wear camel hair suits, eat locusts, slurp wild honey, and go out into the wilderness, but we still are called to call people to repent and to be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. As we follow Jesus, some folks may see us as a bunch of do-gooders, Jesus freaks, Bible thumpers, you know, a bunch of birds. That's okay because when we follow Jesus, we will act different and look different than the rest of the people out in the world. And that's okay because when we act differently and look differently from the rest of the people out in the world, it will cause them to become curious. Hear me now, it'll cause them to become curious. And when they become curious, that's when we can point them to Jesus. But to do that with wisdom, love, and grace, the first thing we have to do is submit our lives entirely to Jesus. Kind of like a good bird dog submits itself to its master. That's what John the Baptist did. Remember how he said this? Though his ministry, Jesus' ministry, follows mine, I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. Later it would be Jesus himself who said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Church, what the story of John the baptizer tells us is that if we give up our lives for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the good news, we won't only save our lives, we'll be able to point others to Jesus and help save other lives too. And that's what the church is for. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is a wonderful one on, on this third Sunday of Advent, this, the, when we lit the candle of joy. It's only fitting that we sing joy to the world. So let's sing that together. Joy to the world.
So to be followers of Jesus Christ, we have to be a little bit like a bird, a little different, and a little bit like a bird dog, someone that can point others to Jesus. To do that, we have to submit our lives to Jesus or else, well, that dog won't hunt. Submit your lives to Christ. Point others to his light. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.